Welcome to Join the Issues, Trademark Law 2020. This webinar is part of the Will Work for Food project. We don't charge for these valuable webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank of your choice if you like what you see. So far, we've raised almost $50,000 for food banks worldwide as a result of our efforts. And with your generosity, we know we will top that mark and we're not stopping there. So welcome. We have an outstanding panel of for distinguished professionals to discuss trademark law with us today. In alphabetical order, they are Eric Ball of Fenwick and West in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. Neil Chatterjee of Goodwin Proctor LLP, also in Silicon Valley, Mary Mazzello of Kirkland and Ellis LLP in New York City, and Lauren Timmons of Alston and Bird LLP in Charlotte, North Carolina. I want to give each of them an opportunity to let you know the food bank in their area, which is important to them. Going in alphabetical order, Eric, would you please lead off? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'd like to highlight Alameda County Community Food Bank. Their website is accfb.org. Uh, this is really near and dear to my family. We've supported them over the years and, and used them earlier in my life myself. So I, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for donating to them or any uh, food bank of their choices here. That's wonderful. Thank you. Neil, please. Thanks. And thanks for having me today, Jeff. Uh, good to be here with all my co-panelists. Uh, there are actually two organizations I'd like to talk up here. One is uh, the Second Harvest Food Bank, shfb.org, uh, which is a well-known food bank uh, here in Silicon Valley. Um, and then another organization that uh, does provide food and other resources uh, to the needy is a group called Sunday Friends. Uh, for those people that have children, they actually organize a number of projects for kids to engage in to put together things like snack bags for kids that are going to school and may not have things like that, um, as well as doing holiday shopping uh, where you just go to a store with a budget and buy a bunch of toys for kids and things like that. Uh, but they do both uh, food and other things for, for impoverished communities. That's great, thank you. Mary? Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to highlight an organization called CAMBA, that's C-A-M-B-A dot org, and that's here in Brooklyn where I am doing this webinar. Um, they do a lot of different things, housing, education, health. Um, they also have a uh, food pantry, Beyond Hunger Emergency Food Pantry. Great, thank you. And Lauren? I'd like to highlight Second Harvest as well. Our local chapter is Second Harvest Metro Lina. Their website is secondharvestmetrolina.org. Um, also, Bird has partnered with them and we've, we've worked, uh, volunteered and helped them sort and give out food. And especially now um, in the last four months with the COVID crisis, they've been donating um, much more than they normally would during this time. So they're really helping out the community. That's wonderful, thank you. And I would like to mention the SOVA Food Bank here in Los Angeles, where I live, it's run by Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles, and it serves the needs of all in the Los Angeles community who are dealing with food insecurity. Their website is www.jfsla.org slash SOVA, S-O-V-A. So if you're listening and you like what you see, if you're so moved, please contribute to one of those food banks or another worthy food bank in your area. Now let's get to the substance of discussion. There was a lot of activity in the United States Supreme Court this year on trademark issues. And Mary, why don't we start by asking you to talk about one of those cases, Lucky Brand Dungarees versus Marcel Fashion Group. And not only are you a very familiar with this case from having read it and studied it, but you were one of the counsel of record in this case. And I understand you were actually in the Supreme Court chambers at counsel table when it was argued, which must have been an exhilarating experience. So please tell us a little bit both about the case and the experience of being in the Supreme Court chamber in the olden days when that's how oral arguments took place to get our discussion going. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, we were uh, very lucky. Our hearing was in early January. So we got in there just a little bit before the COVID crisis kind of hit its height here in the United States. And it was very exciting and very cool. It was my first time uh, being at council table at the Supreme Court. So that was a very new experience for me. You're kind of in a special back room with only the council arguing that day. Then they take you in after everybody's been seated and you kind of have that celebrity feel of being rushed down the aisle to your table. Um, my colleague Dale Pindali argued the motion um, and it was a, uh, a good day also because when the, the order came down we won 9-0 which was a very exciting result for us. So in terms of the substance it was a case that really was about uh, preclusion principles from one case to the next. Um, there was a company called Marcel Fashions Group that had a trademark registration for the mark Get Lucky and it sued Lucky Brand back in 2001 uh, for also using the phrase get lucky. That 2001 case ended in a settlement agreement. Uh, then there was a second dispute between the parties. And this time the case involved again, the trademark get lucky, but then also involved Lucky Brand's other trademarks that include the word lucky, including its housemark Lucky Brand. Uh, that middle case went to uh, trial and Lucky Brand had a judgment against it at the end of that case. Uh, then after that, a third case was filed in 2011. This time Get Lucky was finally resolved. Lucky Brand was no longer using that mark, but some of its other Lucky Brand trademarks were at issue in this third case. And we came on about halfway through that case at the district court and saw that the settlement agreement actually probably barred the claims that were at issue in this third case. So we moved to dismiss based on the settlement agreement that went up, we won, that went up to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit held that we couldn't raise the settlement agreement as a defense under this new test that it called defense preclusion. And the idea of this test was that because we could have raised this defense in the prior dispute between the parties but didn't, we were now precluded from raising it in this third case. And it had a four-factor test with a lot of discretion. It said that litigants could be prevented from raising defenses, even in cases involving new claims, if they could have raised those defenses previously. So that issue went up to the, the uh, Supreme Court. And what they ended up ruling is kind of just to take things back to first principles. They rejected the defense preclusion test, and they said, Instead, we're just, as we've always done, are going to analyze these things under claim preclusion and issue preclusion. And because neither of those applied here, then um, Lucky Brand's defense was not precluded. Uh, and we felt like that was, you know, while it's sort of taking things back to what we all know and studied in law school, was a significant decision because we were concerned that if the Second Circuit's test had stood, defendants would have been in a position where they had to litigate every single defense in every single case for fear that if they didn't do it in this one case, they could be precluded from raising it in the next case. And so you couldn't really make decisions about whether it was worthwhile to pursue a particular defense from one case to the next uh, because of this fear of preclusion hanging over your head. Um, and that was something that was particularly concerning in the Lucky Brand case because it was a trademark case. Uh, one thing that we focused on with trademarks is that trademarks change over time because they are all about marketplace reality. So whether or not you have infringement in one case or not depends a bit on what's happening in the marketplace. What's the logo? What are the goods and services? How strong is the trademark at this point in time? And those factors might go into whether you raise a certain defense in one case versus another. And the Supreme Court uh, caught on to this idea and actually had some language specifically about it in its opinion. Um, what it said was, I have it here, uh, this principle takes on particular force in the trademark context where the enforceability of a mark and likelihood of confusion between marks often turns on extrinsic facts that change over time. As Lucky Brand points out, liability for trademark infringement turns on marketplace realities that can change dramatically from year to year. Um, and so that's, I think, um, while the broader case is about claim preclusion and res judicata principles, there's this particular trademark angle that people should be thinking about and being aware of because it reiterates this idea that what's happening in the marketplace is kind of crucial to any trademark litigation, um, and that can change from one day to the next. Thoughts for thank you. Thoughts from others, please. Yeah, I just want to pick up on on the last point there from Mary. Is that you know is this case can we use it to weaken the B and B hardware decision about TTAB preclusion, which it's I know it's different. It's issue preclusion versus claim preclusion. 
but they both come up to the same fundamental point that market realities change over time. You're five years down the road, you might be in a different situation and maybe that issue preclusion shouldn't apply in the same way. And I'm curious if anyone's seen that uh, be applied and try to weaken uh, BNB hardware or if you expect that that might be a case down the road. I haven't seen it um, happen yet, uh, but I could certainly see it happening. I think there's a little of that language already in there in BNB hardware that they were saying we can have this issue preclusion, but we have to think about the marketplace. And this just makes that point that much stronger. So if BNB hardware is being cited against me, I think I definitely would turn to this language in Lucky Brand to try to uh, make this point about things changing in marketplace realities. I also think that this decision is important in just highlighting the importance of how you're drafting your settlement agreements and coexistence agreements and just making sure that if you're drafting a release and you're drafting it really broadly, you need to make sure that you're thinking of all these potential future eventualities. And, you know, as, as the panelists have said, that could change and if maybe you converge in ways that you didn't foresee. So I think the lesson would be to, to probably try to keep that as narrow as you can when you're negotiating those types of releases. By narrow, Lauren, what do you have in mind? I mean, just to the specific, I would say that, you know, we, we won't challenge your use of the mark in this specific area that you're currently using it. You know, I wouldn't say um, you know, any and all, sometimes people use this broad language of, you know, any and all claims related to the use of the mark. And I think, you know, you just want to be careful in, in using that language if you, you know, think there's any potential for in the future expanding into some areas that maybe don't seem realistic right now and that might be an issue to your client. Yeah, just uh, picking up off of what Lauren said, you know, a lot of times when you mediate uh, or, or resolve these disputes amicably, uh, you know, one of the things that people often really want to get is they want finality. They don't want to have uh, contingent issues hanging out there at any point in the future. But um, what I think this uh, Lucky Brands case, uh, you know, says is even these coexistence agreements or, or things that people agree to now because of the duration of trademark rights and because of the changing natures of markets in which people want to participate, even the difference in the way that people find something interesting or the way to engage with consumers through advertising and the like, because all of those change, coexistence agreements um, at some times are just a limited in time peace treaty. Um, they're not necessarily something that are going to resolve the case for now and forever. The settlements that you sign, to Lauren's point, they might be very narrowly circumscribed, but that's, it's going to be a persistent issue for a company uh, going forward because the nature of markets and advertising and promotion change over time and things that you didn't think are coalescing may very well coalesce just a few years later. Okay, let's move on to our next subject, the next Supreme Court case, Romag Fasteners Inc. versus Fossil Inc. and the topics of willfulness and damages. Eric, would you please introduce this topic for discussion? Sure, thanks, Jeff. This is a long-running trademark dispute about fasteners or snaps uh, between two, uh, they were business partners, two companies that came together, but over time, the relationship soured and they decided they no longer wanted to work with each other. That led to a later trademark dispute. You know, that, that in and of itself is kind of ordinary, but so how did we get to the Supreme Court? Well, it's all about whether or not a plaintiff can recover a defendant's profits because of their infringement and when. And the fundamental question is, can they, do they need to prove willfulness in order to recover a defendant's profits? And I think Justice Gorsuch, who wrote the majority opinion here, which was a 9-0 decision, he has summed it up nicely in his opening lines of the opinion. He says, without question, a defendant's state of mind may have a bearing on what relief a plaintiff should receive. An innocent trademark violator often stands in very different shoes than an intentional one, but some circuits have gone further. And when he says there some circuits have gone further, he's pointing to this deep circuit split where some circuits like the Ninth Circuit, which covers our most populous state, California, or the Second Circuit, which covers New York, you know, another major market of commerce said, you needed to prove willfulness plaintiff before you could go after a defendant's profits. A lot of other circuits like the Third, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eleventh said, willfulness is a factor, but it's not a prerequisite. prerequisite. You don't need to prove that in order to get a defendant's profit. So what do we do? How do we solve this circuit split? Well, Justice Gorsuch, like any good conservative justice, went to the statute and said, you know what? It doesn't explicitly require willfulness in the statute. 
So the statute being the Lanham Act here for trademark claims. And he said, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna require a, def a plaintiff to prove willfulness before they can get a defendant's profits. And, you know, this is a 9-0 decision. So it wasn't just the conservative justices that agreed with this decision. But the big but here is that Gorsuch said, while it's not required willfulness, it's still a highly important consideration in determining whether an award of profits is appropriate. Alito concurred with Justice Gorsuch without the snark, and Sotomayor occurred, uh, concurred again with that emphasis on willfulness being a very important factor. So where does that leave us in analyzing Romag? What I want to throw out to the group is two questions. Is one, what do you think is going to happen in a real world impact in settlement discussions? Is there going to be a wave of plaintiff's litigation trying to get profits that where they couldn't have before? And the second is, what is willfulness? You know, what does that test really mean? How do you prove it? We've seen different courts apply different tests over time. So is that going to change as well? So I throw those questions out to the group. I'll take the first question. I mean, I think that this decision is definitely going to impact settlement dynamics and already has, you know, in some cases that I'm working on, it's just sort of an extra, um, you know, feather in your cap that you can use when you're talking to a defendant, especially one that isn't, you know, is sort of a bad faith defendant that's not easily backing down. Um, I, I had one recently that was saying, well, you know, just sue me and then I'll get to use the mark for another year how, before it gets to be a decision. And, you know, I was able to say, well, okay, fine. You know, besides the legal fees you're going to rack up, you also might have to hand over your profits that, you know, you've been using our mark and everything that all the services that you provided, all that revenue, um, you know, that would come to us as well. So it's, it's something that, um, ultimately helped us get to settlement of just kind of pointing to uh, the higher risk on the side of the defendant if they don't settle. Gary, Neil? Yeah, just to add to, to what, what Lauren uh, was saying, I guess I have, I have two uh, points associated uh, with this. The, 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 the first one is, is that it, it really does change the calculus when you're talking to clients. Like clients will, will ask you very often, you know, what's the likelihood of X situation happen? And in this case, X situation's really bad. And it used to, it used to be, you could kind of say, not much of a chance, you know, like there's, there's kind of this legal doctrine and it works in your favor. And now the Supreme Court has said, you know, it's all kind of squishy. And um, they answered the question that uh, clients um, hate receiving from their outside lawyers most, where what they say, what we say is, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and fundamentally, that's, that's what the Supreme Court said. So when they ask you for a handicap on it, um, all of a sudden, the dollar value at risk goes up, even if there's a, and there's, a, there's more of a percentage that they'll be able to um, collect that uh, kind of award. So the risk profile um, goes up, and, and at times, it can, it can lead to people more interested um, in, in settling. And, but settling on financial terms, the counter narrative to that is, it's really hard to change your names, your advertising strategies and everything. So, um, it, you know, unless a court orders you to do it, it's still, the stakes still can be pretty high. The other consequence that I've seen in a lot of pitches in particular is because of this decision, clients are much more focused on trial and trial, trial ability in addition to trademark ability. And the reason for that is because the way the Supreme Court opinion kind of works is, is focus on the case narrative. Um, what does the case narrative look like? What do the specific facts look like? And to Eric's question of what is willfulness, the Supreme Court said it depends. I mean, more or less, that's what they've consistently said. That's what's been in existence in the common law. And so people that actually are skilled in going to court, trying the cases and being able to build case narratives that are defensible are really important in reducing the scope of that particular risk. Mary, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I'll talk about the second question a little bit, which is what is willfulness? And I think um, kind of to what Neil is saying, it doesn't matter as much anymore what willfulness is. There used to be circuits that very clearly said, it's only willful if you are intentionally trying to trade off the plaintiff's goodwill. Um, so even if you just knew about them, that's not willfulness. You actually have to want to capture some of their goodwill. And now things that go beyond that are going to factor into the damages calculation. So something like willful blindness, something like getting a cease and desist letter, um, but deciding, and eh, no, I think I'm okay because I see X, Y, and Z difference between what I'm doing and what they are doing 
all of these things could end up building into a narrative that traditionally didn't count as willful, but that could, in the eyes of a jury, make you kind of look like a bad guy. And that might be enough to, to lead to damages in situations where when we had a specific willfulness requirement, um, you, didn't, you didn't run that risk. Will there be more of an emphasis in trying these cases, not just on the similarity or differences of marks, but also good person, bad person, that kind of uh, moral sort of storytelling? I think we would all agree, Jeff, that we all represent the victim. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we all represent the victim. Um, you know, the interesting thing about trademark cases is that you may go to trial and there could be substantial judgments, but at the end of the day, this is really about a name and a brand, uh, which is considered way more important than a specific financial outcome. I don't know if other folks agree with that or not, but it, it may change the desire to go to trial, but I think at the end of the day, it's really about what's being used. Will there be additional pressure on defendants in discovery? Will it be easier for plaintiffs to get in, uh, what might be characterized as more intrusive or wide-ranging discovery into a defendant's financial results? I think we're, I mean, I think discovery is going to be largely the same because we're already, you know, you would normally go and push for the intent of a, of a defendant and try to find out how they came up with a mark and what their history is with that mark. So I think, you, I don't think discovery is going to be that different. You might have differences though on the damages side and expert damages reports, and those become much more important because now you have to actually really parse your revenues and your expenses and trying to find out a way to craft that profits number and shrink it as low as possible to say, no, you're not really that profitable anymore. And that becomes a much more important fact and factor than it used to. So in terms of getting these cases settled, on the one hand, the worst case scenario financially becomes worse for defendants. At the same time, as Neil mentioned, Defendants do not want to have to change their brands, their marketing, their logos, et cetera. So any predictions for the future about whether these kinds of cases will become easier or more difficult to settle? It's going to have most of an impact on those in-between cases. Um, you know, the people who are, you know, who could be found, you know, to have reckless disregard or willful blindness, like in the Romag case, I mean, they're going to be more likely to settle than they would in the past. You Usually your clients are just thinking, well, I'm good. I'm in the clear because I didn't do this intentionally. I didn't mean to steal their brand. Um, but whereas now they, they probably will be a little bit more cautious. Other thoughts? Yeah. I, you know, I do think that for smaller companies, I do a lot of work in the tech sector, as I know. Uh, Eric does with 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 a lot of startups. Um, I, I think it's going to increase the desire to settle cases. Although a lot of startup clients are, in, are are interested in doing so, but one of the things that you see in a lot of these coexistence agreements, or when someone's agreeing not to use a mark, is that part of the mediated settlement has this very counterintuitive thing where the rights holder will actually give the defendant some money to rebrand itself. And I think those um, are, because of the increased stakes for these uh, smaller to mid-sized companies, you might see more of those, but less money being put into it. And sometimes, Neil, that money originates with an insurance company for the alleged infringer, makes its way into the hands of the rights holder, and then one way or the other comes around the horn back to the alleged infringer. Will the role of insurance in the settlement of these disputes become more significant given the issue of willfulness and how willful misconduct, generally speaking, is not covered by insurance? It, uh, I'll answer it first and maybe others can. It definitely increases the leverage that insurance companies have in negotiating uh, with, the, uh, with the accused infringer by saying we shouldn't have to contribute as much because we've excluded intentional wrongful acts. And, uh, and, you know, when you're doing mediations in particular, you kind of have this three-way discussion uh, going on very frequently. And uh, with the accused infringer, uh, there's, there, there is a little more leverage uh, that they can have. The counter argument on that is that you can say, look, we might have to disgorge all of our profits anyway, whether or not it's an intentional act. Mm -hmm. And so you can say, and in those circumstances, the insurance coverage would have to pay for it. And a lot of that's going to be in the details of whatever the insurance plan says. Is it a reckless disregard? Is it a willful and intentional? Is it malicious? Those sorts of things. 
What, one thing that plaintiffs need to be mindful in that insurance context, Jeff, is that if, if there is this exclusion for willfulness, you know, the plaintiff always wants to hammer that the defendant is the worst person on earth and they're willful and they're, they're super bad infringers. Well, if you're in that insurance context, you don't necessarily want to do that that strongly at mediation or settlement. You don't want to give the insurer more arguments to say, I don't have to put any money into this settlement. So it, it's something to be, to, to, to be mindful of thinking, maybe you argue more about lost sales or more about the injunction or more about corrected advertising and less so about the willful argument. Even if you're going to argue that at trial, you know, argue that to the defendant, you have to craft it in a way that you're not giving the insurer more reasons to say no. Fair enough. Mary, any last comments on this? I agree with what everyone has said on this. I think that we talked about discovery a little bit earlier. The one piece that um, I think a lot of people are thinking about is whether this might incentivize defendants to rely on an advice of counsel defense. And that leads to all sorts of discovery issues related to privilege. But to to deal with the situation I talked about earlier of where you're saying, well, my mark actually isn't similar to theirs. Lots of times you reach that conclusion because you got an opinion letter from counsel and now you might need to rely on that to get around damages. That will open up a new avenue for discovery. Well, the advice of counsel defense is critically important in many aspects of trademark litigation and perhaps taking on additional significance in the trademark fair use context. So let's turn to that topic next and we'll take a little detour from the Supreme Court back to the Ninth Circuit. And let's focus in on the case of VIP Productions LLC versus Jack Daniels. And uh, we'll put up a picture of the Jack Daniels bottle and the Bad Spaniels dog toy. And Neil, is this a whimsical topic or is this a, a serious topic? Neil, why don't you please uh, give us your views on trademark fair use. Happy to. So uh, there's this case that came out of the Ninth Circuit recently um, called VIP Products versus Jack Daniels. And uh, this case really deals with the difficult intersection between First Amendment expression and parodies and uh, people's trademark rights. And uh, the, the interesting thing that arises in this context is that different trademark owners have different feelings about the celebration of their names and brands. And sometimes they feel like when people are doing parodies or making commentary for their own commercial benefit, they feel like it's actually diluting the quality of their mark. That's what happened in the VIP products versus the Jack Daniels case. In that case, what happened was it was in a very niche body of law and legal practice uh, involving dog toys that make fun of well-known products. And in the VIP products case, what happened was, was someone made a dog toy that was shaped like a whiskey bottle or what appeared to be a whiskey bottle called Bad Spaniels. And instead of saying alcohol content, it would say 100% uh, poo. Instead of uh, the Jack Daniels uh, bottle that says number one, it would say number two. Um, and it would have a number of kind of fanciful and comedic issues to it. It turned out this was a heavily contested and heavily litigated case. And it actually uh, went to a four day bench trial in the Central District of California. And, uh, and then it went up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And even though I think that the legal standard around this really should boil down to what I call the oh please standard of trademark law, which is someone looks at the problem and goes, oh, please, are people really going to fight about this? And we all know that this is kind of comedic and it's making fun of things. Doctrinally, uh, for us fancy lawyers, uh, that isn't the case. And Jack Daniels asserted both a trademark claim saying, you know, they, weren't, they didn't authorize the use of their trademark bottle designs and the like as a dog toy. And they also asserted claims that uh, their trademark rights were being tarnished, that they were being harmed and diluted in some way. There's an um, old case, uh, there's many cases that talk about tarnishment, but the one that's always my favorite is a case called Hormel versus Jim Henson Productions, where when Muppet Treasure Island came out, there was a um, aboriginal uh, pig on an island that was named King Spa-Am, S-P-A apostrophe A-M. And um, Hormel, the makers of the fine product Spam, felt like their, their product was being tarnished and so they decided to sue 
uh, Jim Henson Productions for the use of that name in its film. What happened in the Ninth Circuit case uh, involving uh, the dog toy was that the Ninth Circuit basically said, look, there's this case um, out there uh, called Rogers. And in Rogers, uh, which is an, an old Second Circuit case that dealt with um, a movie that was being made uh, involving cabaret version of people dancing, uh, who is it, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dance moves. Um, and the movie was called Ginger and Fred. They said, look, you know, this is um, really something that's protected under the First Amendment because it's an artistic expression of um, otherwise well-known um, uh, characteristics. And uh, there's essentially a fair use defense um, to the use of Ginger and Fred. And at that point, if you read the opinion, it was really limited to just the naming right. But over time, that has been expanded to cover more and more, uh, more and more things where this fair use concept and First Amendment for artistic expression has grown. And the question that arises is, at what point does the artistic expression protection end and the commercial right begin? As opposed to the Rogers test, there's also just the traditional Lanham Act test, which is, is there confusion or not? Is it tarnishing the image or not? And there's a well-defined legal standard for that. What the Ninth Circuit did is it applied the Rogers test. And it said, you know, a dog toy may be distasteful, but come on, it's kind of funny and it's artistic expression. And even though they're making money off of it, uh, you know, the suggestion of the Ninth Circuit was, that's an available defense here. This case actually garnered a tremendous amount of attention. And now it's, there's a petition for rehearing re on Bonk where uh, the International Trademark Association even has submitted an amicus brief uh, in, support of, uh, in support of Jack Daniels' position, um, basically saying you shouldn't apply the Rogers test to these sorts of claims because this is a commercial product. It's something that's out there. It's got a clear association with Jack Daniels. And now the question is, is, is there a likelihood of confusion and is it, is it tarnishing the brand in some way? Um, and, and so, you know, there's this very interesting debate. One of the other interesting things about it is, is in copyright cases, the fair use concept has gone up to the Supreme Court quite a bit. I'm interested in if the other panel, panelists agree with me on this, but um, I don't think there's a whole lot of, of Supreme Court attention on this particular point. There certainly are ones on protecting First Amendment rights for people that are getting trademark rights. We'll talk about that. But on the defensive end and how trademark rights play into uh, First Amendment and free expression and parity, most of the case law, when you look at it, are really um, competing circuits. Yeah, Neil, I think you're right that there hasn't been a lot on the Supreme Court side on trademark fair use in this context. But so, some of what I've seen people talk about is that the Rogers test is becoming more and more just a transformative test. How transformative is it? Are you funny enough? Are you different enough? You know, to where you, that's where they, and then they hook it back into the Rogers test, which says, and rather than is there a likelihood of confusion, it's, are you explicitly misleading? And if you're transformative enough, therefore you're not explicitly misleading. And I think that likens back to what the Supreme Court has done in the copyright case on the transformative cases. And I expect that if they did take something up, they would have a similar mushy standard of transformativeness that they would apply here. To build off that, Eric, if you in, in the Inta amicus brief, they talk about a, a bottle that's got a unique shape um, that was Don Popping, Don Popping Yon, which was a bottle filled with popcorn, but had the same kind of labeling as, as Don Perignon. And they say, you know, in that case, it, it was a little too close because it's funny, but it wasn't so funny that people wouldn't be confused. It's still a consumable. You're, you're not transforming enough. You're going from alcohol to popcorn, which you can take at the same time. Go ahead. Uh, I think that's the biggest issue here is, is it's getting beyond that artistic expression, which is where Rogers was initially, you know, uh, established. And I think, you know, with, the, with parody, typically, and with these dog toy cases, um, the idea is that, you know, the defendant is using the brand in a way that's, that's transformative and a commentary on the brand itself. So with the Chewy Vuitton case, you know, it's a dog toy. It was a commentary on consumerism. And this one, and you could say 100% poo that it's a commentary on the quality of the alcohol. And so in those cases, you don't want to restrict free speech by preventing someone from, from making that comment, even if 
you know, they're consequently making money off of it. But I think the issue is once you go from there further to products that are more just, you know, like the popcorn, or maybe it's a notebook that has a certain logo on it and it's making the play on words, you know, did you really have to use the brand to make that product? Or are you just writing on the coattails of this, you know, famous brand and making money off of it? And in that case, if you're applying the Rogers test, it seems like you're letting the defendant get off a little too easy. I feel like the confusion test should cover us for a lot of the obvious parodies. I mean, if it's, if you know that you're sort of poking fun at the original, then you're probably not confused. If you get the joke, you're not confused. There might be, you're intentionally maybe trading off of the original, but consumers understand what they're getting. And so it's, it's interesting that we've sort of shifted away from that toward just adopting a completely different test. When I, when results wise, it seems like traditional confusion is still going to protect parody. Yeah, I mean, the problem, right, of, of do you get the joke is that it's an inherently subjective. And so, you know, when, when you're dealing with a lot of likelihood of confusion cases, a lot of times they'll do things like survey data or, you know, try and do things to actually show that there's confusion. In a preliminary injunction context, sometimes, you know, the courts are exercising their own judgment on things. But here it gets, it gets really thorny. And let's face it, in a lot of these sorts of cases, the issue is not really about is there confusion. It's the fact that people feel like their brands are being tarnished. They, don't, they just don't like their name. I'll give one other example just because it's fun. Um, in the interbrief, they cite to another case from the Eastern District of, uh, of Missouri um, where Anheuser-Busch sued VIP products, the very same um, uh, defendant here who um, made a product uh, called, and I apologize in advance for this, butt wiper. And it was a, uh, it was a play on Budweiser, obviously, and it was a dog toy that looked like a bottle of beer that had some similar ornamental features to what you'd see on a Budweiser. And they lost on that one. On that one, the court issued the preliminary injunction, finding there would be a likelihood of confusion. Well, a fascinating area that I think will go on and on in the question of what is transformative and what is not transformative, as it has as it happened in the copyright area, will be a subject of a lot of litigation and a lot of mediations and settlements in the future. Let's move on to our next topic, back from the Ninth Circuit to the Supreme Court and the Booking.com case, USPTO versus Booking.com, involving taking generic names, adding the uh, .com to them, and trademarking them. Is that permissible, or is it not, Lauren? Jeff, well, uh, it is permissible. Um, and we'll, we'll start by kind of going back to the background of this one. So as you probably know, Booking.com operates a website on which customers can, uh, surprise, surprise, book, hotel, uh, and flight reservations. And they've used that uh, domain name since about 2006, and they applied to register their trademarks in 2011 and 2012, and were refused by the trademark office based on descriptiveness and genericness. And they appealed to the TTAB, which affirmed that decision. Um, and then on appeal in the Fourth Circuit, uh, the, they actually received uh, a favorable decision that sort of set aside longstanding precedent that said that if you add .com to a generic term, it doesn't add any additional distinctiveness. It, it doesn't remove the genericness of the term. Um, so of course, the, the USPTO appealed that decision to the Supreme Court. Now, it was important that in the Fourth Circuit decision, um, part of the decision was based on a survey that was performed by Booking.com, which showed that over 70% of consumers found Booking.com to be a trademark and not generic term. And so that was sort of what was a large part of the Supreme Court's decision when it affirmed and found that in an 8-1 decision by Justice Ginsburg, um, that there should not be a bright line rule as the USPTO argued for saying that anything that adds .com to generic term is still generic. Instead, Justice Ginsburg argued that we should focus on consumer perception. And if consumers perceive the term to be a trademark, then it is a trademark, even if it started out as a generic term. Um, and part of that is that there's only one company that can have the .com name. So there's only one booking.com. And, and there was a dissent, uh, even though it was an 8-1 decision, there was a, a pretty strong dissent by Justice um, Breyer. And, and he worried that if you were allowed to protect 
your rights in a generic.com domain that you could potentially have a monopoly over a zone of quote, useful, easy to remember domains, and that this was um, going to inhibit rather than promote free competition. Pointed specifically to the far part of the survey, which showed that although over 70% of consumers found booking.com to be a trademark, over 30% also found washingmachine.com to be a trademark. And so the conclusion there is, you know, maybe consumers just think anything.com is a trademark. And, and is that really accurate? Should we be, you know, giving that much credence to those survey results? And I think this case has a lot of um, interesting implications. I mean, first of all, it's obviously a win for owners of generic.com marks, um, saying that they can register those marks but it is going to be still an uphill expensive battle for them uh, to achieve registration and a survey will likely be required. And then once registration is achieved, it'll still be difficult for them to enforce their rights. They'll still have a pretty narrow registration. Um, of course, the advantage is that they can now seek um, statutory damages for counterfeiting and potential disgorgement of profits. Um, it'll also be interesting to see, and I'd like our panelists' viewpoints on whether, you know, this will open the door to other generic plus some other element marks, you know, potentially a hashtag generic, which the USPTO has previously held was not capable of um, serving as a trademark. You know, potentially there's analogy here, is, is .com any different from adding a hashtag if consumers indeed perceive that as a trademark? Analyst, yeah, your thoughts please. And thank you, Lauren. So uh, I'll, I guess maybe I'll start. I've read booking.com differently than a, a lot of people out there. Um, there's definitely language to support the point of view um, that's made in the dissent in particular, that the opinion stands to the proposition that you can take a generic term, add .com to it, and can get trademark uh, protection. I guess I don't read it the same way because there's a fairly long recitation uh, in the case um, about the detailed factual record and how people associated booking.com with the actual company and how it actually had, had a well understood industry meaning that was tied to it. And I look at it in some ways more as a standard or review case than as a broad statement of law case where Supreme Court kind of looked at it and said, hey, we can't set aside the very careful fact finding with evidence to support the decision. And Booking.com is entitled to a right here because uh, the, the public has said that they have this association. And the patent office was wrong to be challenging it because that association exists, whether you like it or not. Not a lot of people have looked at it that way. So maybe I'm the outlier in the field, but I'm not sure I see the broad proposition of just taking a generic name and slapping .com on it will we'll necessarily guarantee people a trademark rights. Right, and I would note that Justice Ginsburg specifically stated that in the opinion that, you know, that, that was not what she was holding, that's not what the court was holding, um, that it depends on, you know, what consumers perceive, and that simply adding .com to a generic term does not automatically uh, render something a trademark. Yeah, but of course, if you look at the Rogers case, which we talked about a few minutes ago, it was being held out for a very limited holding, and it's been continually right. expanded by case law. So. Uh, Supreme Court may say one thing, but the world may view it different. <laughs> Mary, how do you view it? That I, um, I initially viewed it as something fairly broad, and my reaction was to the fact that it was that the decision was so tied up in these surveys and public perceptions, and I wondered if there was room there to actually say something that feels so clearly generic to me, like washing machine or washing machines could actually become a trademark for somebody if they could put in enough evidence that consumers have started associating this word with them. Could people actually take stuff that, you know, in the dictionary has a very clear definition and use it for exactly that defined good and get a right just by investing enough that, um, that the public starts to associate it with you. And that seemed, um, that's not what they said exactly, but that was the opening that I started wondering about when I read the case, which seems like it would be a pretty significant step um, away from how I'd always understood generic. Yeah, yeah and I'll just add up. I wonder if that's a bad thing. If let's say someone puts a hundred million dollars behind a new branding campaign to have washingmachine.com and they be know as, known as the number one sellers of washing machines. And if, if you want to go buy a washing machine, you go to washingmachine.com and that's what, where everyone goes and they know there's a certain quality of washing machines that you get from wash, washingmachine.com. That's, I mean, at the fundamental principle of trademark law is about consumer perception and do where consumers associate a mark 
with a source. And if the consumers end up associating it there and that surveys show it, then why not give them that mark and that brand? And if someone else can use, you know, some other kind of brand that to support washing machines doesn't mean that you can't use the word washing machine in a dictionary sense and talk about washing machines. But you are the source brand of that of that product. And I don't know that's a bad thing if that's what consumers come down at the end of the day and see as a brand source. On that, I think, uh, you know, I think that the our, our principles of, of fair use can take care of most of the, the downsides on that. And I don't think it would happen often uh, because it is so hard to associate a generic term with one company. But I think the point is that if that has happened through the investment of the company and through consumer perception, then, you know, is it necessarily fair to say, no, it, it's just not. And then, you know, not allow allow then a, th a third party to ride on the coattails of that that one entity who did spend all of that time and money to do that, and then confuse consumers even further. The fears that some people have of this decision, I'm not really bothered by. I think it, it it's going to be difficult to to prove trademark rights in anything that that's that um, generic. Uh, but I think if you can, then then I don't really see the harm in that. Um, one other. Uh, element of this decision that I thought, you know, could potentially cause issues is just the holding that, you know, adding .com to something could, could in some circumstances, give it some distinctiveness. And whether that will have an effect on UDRP, you know, uniform domain name uh, resolution policy proceedings, and whether, um, you know, typically in those kind of cases, if you have your trademark and you want to go after a domain name that is your trademark.com, World Intellectual Property Office, uh, wherever you're before, will say, okay, that's essentially identical. We're going to discount the .com. Well, now are they going to take this decision and, and sort of give more um, emphasis to the top level domain that's used? Well, the interesting case. questions for the future. And <laughs> let's turn to a different topic. We have just a few minutes left. And no trademark webinar would be complete, would it, without a discussion of what are sometimes called offensive or scandalous or vulgar trademarks. So let's talk about that. It's a hot topic. Mary, would you please kick off the discussion on that? So I'm going to start the discussion back in 2017 with the TAM case before the Supreme Court. And this was a case concerning uh, disparaging trademarks. A rock band that called themselves The Slants wanted to register the name The Slants as their trademark. Um, this was a term that had been used in a derogatory fashion toward Asian people. Um, this was an Asian American band that said they were trying to reclaim this phrase for themselves. Uh, the trademark office nonetheless rejected the registration and it did so under the Lanham Act, which has a section that says you can register any mark unless it, quote, may disparage a person living or dead. And so under that provision, they said that this could not be registered. It went to the Federal Circuit, which said that the disparagement clause was unconstitutional. And then that went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court agreed with the Federal Circuit. It decided that this disparagement clause is unconstitutional. It got there in a couple different ways. There were sort of two main opinions. Um, Alito's opinion said that the disparagement clause wasn't narrowly tailored to achieve a substantial government interest. Um, the Kennedy decision focused more on viewpoint discrimination. So when the examiners are reviewing the trademark applications, they're making a judgment call as to which uh, messages are okay and which messages are not. And because of that judgment call that they're making, you have viewpoint discrimination. After that, there was a kind of a follow-on case, and this was Bianco v. Brunetti. Uh, there, an artist wanted to register the trademark, I'll spell it, F-U-C-T, for clothing. And this was also rejected, and it was rejected under uh, the same part of the statute that had a provision saying you cannot register mark if they are immoral or scandalous. So under that provision, this mark was rejected. Same thing, went to the federal circuit, held unconstitutional, and then it went up to the Supreme Court. And at the Supreme Court, the uh, court decided that this is an unconstitutional provision because it disfavors certain ideas. Um, and again, you get back to this idea of a viewpoint-based bar where certain things are being deemed to be okay speech and certain things are not. Um, and one of the examples that was pointed out was that the PTO had, had registered DARE to resist drugs and violence. 
but had refused to register you can't spell healthcare without THC. And this was an example of the way that uh, the viewpoint discrimination angle worked into this statute when the examiners were reviewing uh, trademark applications before them. There was, uh, people suspected that this would lead to a rise in people filing offensive trademarks or swear words, things like that. Um, I understand from Lauren, actually, who looked into this, that that did happen to some degree, especially on the curse word side. Um, and I'll let her jump in in a minute to to give some more background on that, but it seems it did happen on the curse word side. I don't know if it happened so much on the uh, disparagement side, and I think we are actually seeing that more and more companies at least are trying to evaluate their trademarks and move away from things that might have a disparaging you know, meaning or connotation. I mean, that's something that we've seen a lot more strongly in the last couple of months. So I suspect because of that, we're not seeing as many filings for disparaging mark and that we're actually seeing a lot of those just come out of the marketplace altogether. Other kind of follow-ons to this are some of the concurring opinions. I sort of threw it back to Congress a little bit and said, we're striking this down, but you know, consider if there's maybe a list of words or something that would avoid this viewpoint discrimination issue. Congress hasn't taken that up. And I wonder, again, since we are being uh, the marketplace kind of address this to a degree, if that might persuade them that they don't have to, to address this issue uh, as much as maybe people thought they had to a year ago. Uh, and then you're also seeing some people talk about what does this mean for trademark and First Amendment? And I think it's interesting. I mean, so many of the topics we've talked about today are trademark and First Amendment. Another one that has come out of this is what it means for dilution, and does that step on the toes of First Amendment? I think the situation we have here of a government agency actually making the calls about, you know, what speech is okay versus not is different from the dilution statute, but I know that's one jump that at least in the academic literature you've seen people say, look, look, we've been saying it all along, dilution violates the First Amendment, and now somehow we're going to be able to to use that, use uh, Tam and, uh, and Brunetti as our hook for that. Um, so I think that's, right now you, you, you can go ahead and register whatever you want, but the bigger question is what this type of First Amendment analysis might mean for other aspects of trademark law. Analysts, what does it mean? Um, I'm gonna go out and register a whole bunch of dirty words. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and say on that point, I did check a couple of months ago uh, for another panel I was on and it there were over, I wanna say over 300 applications live for, that included the four letter word that starts with F and over 300 that included Included the four letter word that starts with S. And so that was a bit surprising because you I haven't really been hearing about that that much. But I will note that a lot of them were pending applications and not registered. Um, and I've read in uh, other articles that a lot of these applications for somewhat scandalous marks are being refused because they're, they're being applied for in connection with clothing and they're being rejected as ornamental or, which is a little bit more surprising, as being a commonplace phrase. So it turns out that now the phrase F-U-C-K-U is nearly as common or considered as common as drive safely and therefore it, not capable of being a trademark. What about the whole issue of racial and ethnic slurs being used as trademarks? What is, what is the future going to hold on that? Are we going to see more cases like the TAM case where members of groups are trying to reclaim words which have long been considered racial and ethnic slurs? Or will we see people moving away from those kinds of words because of just general societal conditions and our increased sensitivity over the last few months to these issues. I, I don't know how other folks feel about it, but I feel like the Supreme Court has kind of said if people want to seek protection in those uh, controversial names and the like, that they're allowed to do it. Um, and they're allowed to do it to stop other people from trying to you know, diminish whatever brand value there is. The, the question is not, Jeff, whether or not someone has a brand, a good brand or a bad brand. The question is just, does it do people associate you know that name or that mark mm -hmm. with a particular set of quality attributes yeah yeah and i think mary had a good point that while it's permissible like neil says it, it it's, it's less likely to be happening maybe because people are moving away from it i mean we've seen lady antebellum the band trying to change their name to lady a and we've seen dixie chicks are now just the chicks or i can't remember it's the chicks or chick but but you know people are moving away from a more negative connotation brand into something else swear word brands are i feel like a little different because sometimes those are catchy or interesting and i 
you know, they, they're not my bread and butter clients, but they are in like the, the alcohol and beer industry, sometimes the clothing, some, some food products. Those are, there's specific industries where those are more important kind of catchy phrases that you're more often to see a brand in that context. You know, in, in software tech and gaming where I live, there's not many people swearing in their name <laughs> as, as part of the brand. Yeah. But, but, I, but I think it will, I think it is important to, to some industries, the food and beverage industry for one. I think it's interesting on that point of people changing, you know, even like the Washington Redskins, I mean, who fought so hard um, for so long in the courts to keep their name and they were right along with the TAM case and, and were able to keep their, their registrations because of that. And now, you know, in the last month or so, they've also announced that they're changing their name. So I think it just proves that, you know, while yes, you can obtain or registration for a disparaging mark. I mean, the marketplace will decide whether whether that actually is a viable business decision. Okay. Well, we have just a minute or two left. If anyone would like to add some final words, some big picture commentary, now's the time. Maybe I'll start, and if other people have things to add. Uh, so one of the things that kind of struck me when we were looking at all the Supreme Court opinions, not the Jack Daniels uh, opinion, but the Supreme Court opinions, is pretty consistently the case law has been coming out in favor of strong and broader trademark rights. And uh, that's that's one, is that all, almost all of these are pretty much coming in favor of the uh, trademark owners and the rights that they want to assert. And I think that's important. The other thing that underlies some of these decisions is that there's a lot of second guessing of the US Patent and Trademark Office. Um, the Supreme Court, you know, in both the booking.com opinion um, and in the TAM opinion, they kind of went out of their way to find examples that were kind of analogous examples to the ones there and say, it sure seems kind of arbitrary that, you know, you're, you're not giving these guys a right, uh, but you're giving these other people a right. There's kind of a, I, I can't phrase it any other way, a kind of a mistrust, uh, the way the rules are being applied and, and a question as to whether they're being applied fairly. Th those are kind of the two takeaways that I have. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the Supreme Court take up the fair use issue in maybe not, you know, next year, but in, in the near future, it seems like along the lines of the cases that they've been taking. And since there is such a circuit split on that. Um, so I think that's something to look out for. Also on the, the point Neil made about just Supreme Court sort of taking a closer look at the USPTO's practices, I think that might be playing into what they're you know doing recently with just trying to establish a stricter level of scrutiny when they're looking at new applications. I mean, you, you'll see, I mean, there's the chi whole program that they're working on to try to stop Chinese applicants from filing with um, fake statements of use and they're looking, they're doing audits to make sure you're actually using your mark. Um, they're being stricter on specimens. So I think they're kind of trying to standardize a bit more and trying to get things right. And maybe that has played into it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just close with, I think these cases also reinforce the fundamental per principle of consumer perception matters. Whether it's uh, offensive marks, do you want to have an offensive mark and have consumers perceiving your brand in connection with an offensive mark? Or even in the willfulness context, as Neil said, you know, that trial strategy matters and whether or not you're going to be seen as the willful infringer matters from the start. Or in the Lucky Brands case, you know, consumer perception ch might change over time. So the, the claim persuasion might not be as strong over time. So these cases kind of reinforce the fundamental question in trademark law is what does a consumer think? And are they really confused or is it a funny joke? Well, it's no joke that this has been a wonderful webinar. And I want to thank all four of you. Eric Wall from Fenwick and West LLP, Neil Chatterjee from Goodwin Proctor LLP, Barry Mazzello from Kirkland and Ellis LLP, Lauren Timmons from Austin and Bird LLP. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all so much. Let me finally remind everyone uh, that this is part of the Will Work for Food project. If you like what you saw, and how could you not, please consider contributing to a food bank. We'll put up the names and URLs of the food banks that all of the panelists mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So to all of you listening, to all of you on the panel, thank you all very, very much for a wonderful webinar. We are now complete. Mm -hmm.